Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Samson. I'm a CEO and founder of Corn Street Partners. Today is my great pleasure to be the moderator of our very exciting panel. It's about the topics of new market opportunities for tokenized assets and digitized securities. Um, so I have been involved in the industry, uh, fintech industry for over 20 years since doing a mobile payment uh, at the top at the dot com days, uh, I've been involved in uh, many organizations, uh, profit, non profit, um, helping to push and develop the, the ecosystem. Constrict Partners is an award winning global decentralized investment banking group. It's also a professional fintech and digital asset consulting firm. Okay, so before going into the panel, I would like to give a quick market status about tokenized assets and digitized securities, right? Where we are now, is it still just a concept? Is it happening? Uh, we heard a lot of news from different sources, so I'm gonna give a quick snapshot, right? First of all, um, according to the World Economic Forum report, they projected that the tokenized asset market will exceed $24 trillion by 2027. So as you can see on the chart, we are right here, 2020, right at the start. From another perspective, um, if you look at the asset allocation according to market capitalization of different asset class, a digital asset at the top is only very small portion of the total capital market, right? But one interesting fact is that um, digital asset is the first at new asset class in 20 years since ETF has been invented in 1990 in Canada. Also from another perspective, from this very small portion of from digital asset on the total market capitalization is actually contribute 30% of the transaction volume and turnover uh, of the total mar capital market now, right? So it is very significant in terms of turnover volume. And if we look further, a lot of um, major operation actually coming into this space and, 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 and launching different projects, right? Starting with the big banks from the US, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, they all rolling out their stable coins. Uh, we look at the a larger uh, financial institution, they are issuing bonds in different types in tokenized formats in Europe and also in US, big mutual funds as well. And our friends here, uh, Morningstar also roll out the first rating product on digital assets. If we look deeper, it's not lacking of government or big banks issuing tokenized security products around the world. And this is from uh, also our friends from Crypto Valley, their recent report for PwC. Uh, maybe we can uh, get more insights from them later on. Right. If we look at the, some of the recent news, right? SEC already fully regulated, approved stable coin can be a deposit in the regulated bank, right? One of the early days, crypto exchange Kraken in US upgrade themselves to become a proper commercial bank. Look closer in Hong Kong, we have a regulator approved the first digital asset trading venue in Hong Kong. So STO exchange become a reality in Hong Kong now, right? And of course, uh, you heard a lot from the news, digital RMB just around the corner. They already do, doing trial in China and Hong Kong as well. And just a news two days ago, China Construction Bank actually issued 3 billion worth of debt over blockchain. And we look further, over 15 countries have defined regulatory framework for blockchain-based security tokens report. So many things happening, very hot market. What is going on? So today is our great pleasure to put to bring together and thank you for Hong Kong Blockchain Week for coordinating this. 
a very amazing panel with experts from different backgrounds, from capital market, technology firms, rating agents, ecosystem building. So without further delay, I would like to bring out our guest panelists uh, from today. Uh, first, um, Martin Sabine. Uh, I would like to pass to Martin uh, to introduce himself. Oh, actually. Uh... Okay, Sam. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Martin Savine. I'm the chairman of the Summerley Group. That's a, a Hong Kong-based corporate financial services group. Um, and our clients are mostly Hong Kong listed companies. I've been working in the financial markets in, in Hong Kong for about 40 years. Um, and during that time, mostly this is a con has been a conventional sort of business. The precedent is honored and established structures and procedures followed. Um, but now I think there's a wind of change blowing through the markets. Um, we ourselves became a listed company three years ago uh, with the ambition to expand our range of services. And the whole fintech area is um, central to that. And we're convinced, in fact, that this area will disrupt and, and enhance financial services uh, in Hong Kong. Um, and our clients you know, will expect and demand um, uh, that sort of service from us. Great. Thank you, Martin. Well, we look forward for your sharing later on. All right. So uh, may I also introduce uh, Amy from uh, Crypto Valley? Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm blessed today with the sun in my face. So uh, <laughs> It's, it's a sunny day over here in Zurich. Um, my name is Emmy Ludins, and I'm wearing my hat today as a Crypto Valley Association board member. Besides that, um, I have the pleasure to, to cover Ledger's enterprise solution in EMEA, the Ledger Vault, and I'm also on the Council of uh, the Bancor Foundation and um, excited to explore the topic uh, of today with you all. Thank you, Amy. Well, may I also introduce uh, Chris Carlin from Morningstar? Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Carlin with Morningstar. Uh, been here about four years looking after data products alliances for the Asia region. Um, as you know, Sam had mentioned earlier, we had rated a crypto asset earlier, a token uh, for a debt instrument. Um, and it's something that we're looking to do a little bit more of. Um, as these instruments come online and really excited to be a part of this discussion. Thank you, Chris. And last but not least, uh, may I introduce Latin from IBM. Yeah. Thank you, Sam, and uh, really glad to be here. My name is Mitten Gore, and I serve as Director of Financial Services and Financial Sciences and Digital Assets. I've been in this space now for since 2012, so it's been eternity. And uh, as a part of my role, my job is to be able to bring in an understanding as well as our technology to be able to have the large financial institutions adapt themselves to this evolution that digital assets and, and crypto you know, tokens bring to that entire ecosystem in terms of market, uh, you know, in terms of uh, market infrastructure, but at the same time, understanding some of the technology requirements that many of the regulators require many of the financial services to adhere to. So really excited to be here and excited to sort of learn and share from my experiences with the panel. Thank you, Latin. Well, and I'm Samson Lee. I'm uh, the CEO and founder of Constrict Partners. I actually hosted the, um, the STO panel also with Hong Kong Blockchain Week last year uh, when we were still able to host actual conference <laughs> at the airport, right? This year we are hosting this virtually here but it's great. We have guests from different continents, different backgrounds. And one year passed by, we have seen a lot of things happening in this ecosystem, right? It's very exciting, positive progress. So I want to start out with getting a view from a different guest of what role do you see asset organization and digitized securities can play in the future or maybe near future of the financial market and where do you see the new opportunities lay, right? I would like to have a more uh, 
interactive discussion, feel free to jump in or if you disagree, any comment. But um, may I invite Martin maybe to sh share your view first? Because I think no matter what we do, right, we cannot um, be away from the traditional capital market because it is finance, right? Maybe a different ways to doing the finance or, you know, new ways doing things. But I think the fundamental is still be there. So I would like to uh, get your view to get our discussion started. Martin, would you please um, share some view of how do you see? Okay, yeah, Sam. Well, look, I'll, that's a big question. I'll try and start the, the ball rolling. And, and I mean, in principle, I think many of the conventional um, financial transactions can be uh, uh, tokenized uh, or benefit from um, digitization and blockchain technology. Um, and I, I do see this is beginning to, to happen. Um, uh, although, there, as I mentioned before, there, there's a, a certain inertia in traditional capital markets. Um, people uh, are used to doing things in a certain way and tend to resist change initially. But I think um, very soon a network effect builds up and the potential um, is really runs right through uh, financial transactions. I mean, just uh, a couple of examples that I looked at this week as we were giving prizes. I hope I'm not giving anything away, but I mean, traditional equity uh, raisings, for example, um, there was a, a hedge fund, it, in some ways, a conventional open ended hedge fund um, tokenized with blockchain technology. Um, but the, the advantage um, basically is that. Uh, it gives you additional flexibility and additional liquidity. So, um, in a typically a hedge fund, a specialist hedge fund, or a, or a private equity fund, um, will require quite a substantial lockdown, maybe three years, maybe longer. Um, but if you um, have tokens uh, and you have them on an exchange, um, you can uh, uh, provide some liquidity um, without. Uh, uh, problems in the underlying fund, which will take on um, investments which are not very liquid. So you provide liquidity and flexibility for the investors without penalizing or limiting the investment um, uh, plan of the, of, of the fund. Um, and that particular one was also fully licensed by SFC. I think that maybe a topic will come on to, but I think regulation is clearly going to play a key role. Um, I mean, another example, more like a loan, um, uh, this was a, a company that was um, extracting certain minerals from seawater. Um, and they had, uh, I mean, it was structured and described as a secured loan. They had a trustee which, which held a physical product um, and the tokens were exchangeable for 10 grams of magnesium. I'm not sure whether you want 10 grams of magnesium, um, but the, you know, the, the, that, that was um, uh, a structure which was really, when you looked at it, uh, pretty safe. Um, it had a trustee. Um, you could at any time uh, exchange your token for a certain amount of product, which has a, an open market, perhaps not in the amounts of 10 grams, but uh, generally speaking, an open market. Um, but on the other hand, in due course, uh, uh, this could be repaid. So, um, you know, just a couple of examples there. I think you could go through, I mean, for us with IPOs and so on, I think that's probably an area um, where the transparency and efficiency uh, could be improved. Um, but just sort of starting off with two fairly standard things, equity raising, loan raising, um, they can uh, benefit from these, these new developments. Interesting, yeah. Th th thank you, uh, Martin, for sharing. Well, uh, everyone, for your information, Martin's chairman of Somony Capital. Somony Capital uh, is one of the most active firm on, in the corporate finance advisory field in Hong Kong. And by the way, Martin, congratulations. I heard you guys just won the 2020 Merch Market China M&A Awards and be the financial service M&A financial advisor of the year. Oh, okay. Thank you very much uh, for that plug, Sam. That's, that's true. We did, yes. 
Yeah, so it's very interesting from your comment. So you de- you do see actually tokenization can bring value as you as from your example on the on the first example on the on the funds. Obviously, funds is is very traditional product, but it is actually can make it become a better product, right? Bringing in extra liquidity, cross border trading, and things like that. And on your second example, it can actually create new financial product that doesn't exist before, right? So this is very interesting. Yeah, so, that's a fair summary. I think um, uh, you know it can either uh, build on features uh, and improve the efficiency and flexibility of of the way things have been done traditionally, or it can you know really beat a new path, and people will you know have to uh, get used to that in due course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very interesting. So um, may I then ask uh, your comment, Emmy? Because uh, as I mentioned earlier, like I, I know you guys like Crypto Valley have been uh, working very closely with PwC uh, on the crypto report, right? Since uh, I think maybe 2017 or 18, and now it's the sixth edition and you guys have done extensive research on the global basis. So, so how do you see um, this is happening in terms of the convergence and you know the new companies and project coming up and, and where's the industry is heading? Thanks for the opportunity and the question, Sam. So basically security tokens are this new layer or not layer, but, but this new invention of um, DLT. And we believe that it's bound to be mainstay. So it's going to, it's going to be the centerpiece of future security value chain uh, landscape. And, um, the opportunities we see now shaping will reset the environment that will provide greater efficiency, transparency as regards to the security issuance, um, trading, and also port settlement. So I can echo um, echo uh, you all uh, that it's definitely going to, to um, offer us greater efficiency. What's also important to add that um, in Europe and in Switzerland, uh, we need that authorities acknowledge that DLT, and this, this already happened in Switzerland with the blockchain law uh, in September, now in 2020, they have to acknowledge that security tokens can provide clear and, and added value in terms of, um, of um, post-settlement trading issuance. And um, shall also add that uh, if we just think about that, the global real estate market, the, the total value of the global real estate market is 280 trillion USD. And if we only tokenize just 1% of that, then that's 2.8 trillion. So it's a huge opportunity um, what is unfolding in front of our eyes. We of course need more, need more clarity and uh, not only on the legal um, aspect, but also when it comes to interoperability between various uh, various ways. I mean, Ethereum is, is one of the, not preferred, but probably the most popular chain um, on which the ERC uh, 1400 is, is a token what many players use. And it's important that that if someone is not using Ethereum, maybe can also trade with another, um, with another uh, token which is uh, supported by another infrastructure. So um, another, um, another way or, or another aspect, which I would like to, to uh, touch on that we will see a lot of, lots of synergies and opportunities between security tokens and DeFi. For example, um, if you use your security token as a collateral in DeFi, in a DeFi app like Maker or Compound, that is uh, of, of great use and tokenization will push the marginal cost of creating a financial asset down. Just imagine that right now creating a financial asset is not necessarily cheap. And I believe that the cost of this is going to, is going to be um, much, uh, much uh, lower. Mm-hmm. Very interesting, yeah. Thank you for, for your sharing. So going back to your point, about tokenizing real estate, right? And uh, together with the earlier point that Martin have raised about, you know, creating a tokenized fund, right? So 
let, let's just go down for that path, right? Because, for example, on the conventional market, we know fractional ownership is actually not a new thing, right? Because when we buy a REIT, right, we, we, we talk about real estate, a REIT fund is actually a fractional ownership. I buy shares of a REIT, right? And, and is, is real estate. So how do you see Martin, right? And let's, let's have some discussion here. Say, if we go to tokenizing real estate, right? There, there are, you know, a lot of real estate funds out there, but now there's real estate tokenization, right? Um, how do you see, or anyone, right? Like, how do you see this might be heading, right? In terms of comparing to the tra traditional read structure and things like that, you know? Well, I, let, let me just come briefly, because I think I've had my, my turn, but um, yeah, yes, I mean, as you mentioned, fractional ownership, uh, through REITs, um, which which have had pretty broad acceptance, um, they haven't really got off the ground so much in in Hong Kong. They, they've had um, no particular tax advantage here, but Singapore uh, is is a big centre, and, and also Australia and the States, of course. So I think yes, the the principle of fractional ownership of of um, real estate is, is is pretty well established, uh, and I think you know the concept of tokenization. Can, can build on that. Um, perhaps I'll let other people comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 maybe, so, Chris, so now with all this new product coming up, you know, please go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I, I think, you know, Martin, to your point, um, I've written about this extensively in terms of what I use the word instance economy as opposed to uh, that essentially what fractalization does. We do two things, right? One is you're relying upon the ability for us to not just fractionalize the asset from a systemic perspective, but also take the fraction of that fraction, which creates some truly trying to create a global market of bankable and non-bankable assets, which is ability for us to create value from the assets that are not in traditional asset class space. But essentially we are truly trying to go after the global marketplace, which sort of creates not just the consumers of, the, of, of this technology, but also creates a much larger access points to these markets, creating more liquidity, as you mentioned, as, as Martin mentioned earlier. So think about sort of a one as a class, one set of rules, global markets and regional access points where you could provide some level of enforcement from regulatory perspective, thereby creating sort of a much larger marketplace, much larger liquidity pools. Uh, I think in general that has a exponential effect or what we've been now calling exponential finance, which allows us to be able to truly address the global accessibility to some of these products that historically have only been limited to the developed or many of the advanced economies. And I think that has an uplifting effect or uplifting impact on various sort of sectors of economy which have been left out. So that has a both, both element of financial inclusion but it also has the element of creating much larger, you know, much larger marketplace, which has been the sort of proverbial goal of many financial systems across the world, I think. So I'll pause at that and love to get the comments from uh, the panel. Well, I think with the inclusion thing, one of the things that I saw um, talking to Fusong Exchange here in Hong Kong as they're coming online was investor education. I think it's one thing to make something available to a wide audience. It's another thing to, uh, especially when you go to the mass retail, um, to have the audience understand what they're purchasing, um, how they're purchasing it. And that brings up other things like uh, compliance across jurisdictions. Um, we saw on some of the um, tokens that came out this year, um, a lot of restrictions if they're not inside the US, uh, US people can't purchase those securities. Um, and so I think, the, and also security, people need to be convinced that these are safe investments as well, and they're not gonna be, you know, the headlines obviously are the, you know, the stolen Bitcoins, but uh, people need to understand the security level that they're entering into um, as well. And then I think from a Morningstar perspective, where we can, where we do rate these types of assets, mainly debt securities, uh, public equities and funds, um, we can add, you know, some transparency to that process uh, by providing a rating for some of these assets if they're digitized. Um, what we normally do now, we're rating the paper instrument, but um, as we go forward, I think we'll see a lot of securities uh, listed in solely in digital form as well. So I think that's where Morningstar's will, that's where ICR will coming in the future as we reach that inflection point where 
we're no longer looking at paper instruments behind digital tokens and we're looking at purely digital instruments. And that's where I really hope that we get to. And I think that'll happen slowly and then very quickly over time. But I do like to discern one thing. I'll, I'll, I'll say this very quickly. I do want to discern between dematerialization and digitization. And there are two different elements. Yes, we have seen with REITs and many of the other elements of what we have done to sort of create the digital space. But in true sense of what I think, you know, um, Emmy mentioned earlier is the ability for me to take this token and move the token, which means the movement of that asset is the final sort of change of ownership, change of transfer, followed by a settlement, as opposed to relying on these massive back office function that adds to, to the cost of, of the trade. So I think it's dual element, right? One is we are relying upon finality, finality of the transaction at the same time as a cost reduction effort. And of course, the regulatory elements could be done at the endpoints. And I completely agree with you, Chris, that just because you make it democratic doesn't mean that it's it's educated. You have to have some level of education that has to follow that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think having some standardization on the rating is very helpful, especially for if we really want to have the institution coming into the marketplace, right? So, because uh, uh, it need to be, you know, different product need to be benchmarked. And, and how, how do you see, Chris, from the rating point of view, you guys obviously very experienced on the conventional side when you're starting to try to rate some of this digital product. Uh, what what do you see are the challenge and what need to be uh, added to your existing models and things like that? Well, and and I'm not sure Morningstar will fill this role. And so um, when we rated the Fat Brands um, tokens, uh, we rated the two debt instruments behind those tokens. Um, and when that uh, press release came out, at least I saw on Forbes, um, I was cold called by people who had tokens they wanted rated um, from all over the world, from, you know, I would say from Israel through to uh, uh, you know, parts of Asia. And, but a lot of those tokens are very small, uh, privately held companies. And I think that's where I see the issue coming in um, long term is the information needs to be available in a way that we can rate those instruments and those instruments have to want to be rated. So they have to provide the information. And I think you need companies that are gonna provide that uh, transparency, um, make that information available to analysts uh, to do the research, then publish a fair rating on those assets. And I think that will feed then the institutional side that may have that as part of their investment process. And I think we, are, we can get to that point for some of the really large securities that I see coming online. Um, there's some big debt securities in the U.S. that should be tokenized uh, very soon, uh, either later this year or early next year, where I think we might have a hand in rating those securities. So I think there's two spectrums of the market. One is a very small spectrum. And I think there's some niche players that can fill that role, and that's probably not a role for Morningstar. Um, but I think in terms of true large, inst large scale uh, institutional investments, that's a role I believe we can play. And I know we can play in the debt markets. Um, and certainly if uh, mutual funds were to be fully digitized um, in public equities, uh, that's an area that we do have focus and we do have analysts covering the market. Right, yes. Well, so um, so, so Martin, I have another question, like, because in, in, in the conventional, like, you know, investment banking, people often talk about underwriting, right? And, and, and we don't see this happening in, in the STO, uh, digital space yet um do you see, do you think like this will happen in the future like with maybe more rating product or you know um because because now i think one of the big, big challenge of the of the industry is the liquidity right people do an ic and sto you know sometimes like they they might not be able to raise the full amount some of them actually below the soft cap and they cancel the project so, so do you see that there will be a role for, for investment banker or some really underwriting process been happening and what it takes to make that happen? Yeah, it's, it's, um, so it's a very interesting question. I mean, it, when you talk about underwriting, in fact, at least in the Hong Kong market, and I think in most Asian markets, the so-called hard underwriting has pretty much disappeared. So um, a lot of it is best efforts if it's for secondary listings um, uh, and, and otherwise on IPOs, it's really a selling job. So now uh, the underwriting uh, technically is only done 
right at the end of the process of book building and selling. Um, and of course, um, you know, there, there are challenges to that traditional um, market with say direct selling and these uh, SPACs uh, and special acquisition companies and so on. So uh, there's, there's quite a lot going on, on in the market. Um, the, the, the line between you know, sales and underwriting um, is, is blurred. Um, but, but I think in, in terms of providing liquidity um, for some of the token issues, I mean, they, they, the questions are the same. And I think um, when um, the market grows, as it will, then I think, uh, as, as Chris is saying, you know, there'll be certain um, smaller issues which may be, may be difficult, just, just as liquidity is difficult for small listed companies. Um, but for the larger ones, I, I do see um, that, that the investment banks will be drawn in. And, and just to you know, uh, expand that a little bit, um, what helps with liquidity is certainly, you know, as has been said, um, uh, a rating, an investor education, um, but, but also uh, certain, um, if you like, accommodation with regulators. So you know, what's happening now, I think, with um, some of these issues is they're getting big enough to attract the attention of regulators and you, at the moment perhaps you have entrepreneurs on one side regulators on the other and it's not uh, altogether easy match yet um, but Ashley Alder the head of the SFC here gave a, a talk um, about a week ago at all uh, ago which which he it's enunciated a, a pretty clear principle which which was um, if it's the same business with the same risks and it should have the same rules. And I, th I think the industry, the, you know, the new industry of digital securities and, and uh, tokenized assets is, is going to have to um, embrace regulation a little bit. And, and that will bring it more into the mainstream. Um, it won't be altogether easy, at least in Hong Kong, the regulations don't fit very well. Um, actually, Alda talked about tagging some additional regulations onto anti-money laundering. Well, you know, that may or may not be the right uh, way to, to put it, but I think we, we need to lear learn some lessons from, for example, Ant Financial here. Um, and, and who knows ex you know, the exact story there it will only probably come out over a period of time. But I think one lesson is, if you get big enough, then the regulators will eventually come and look very carefully at you. It may take them a little while to come on, but, but you can't escape. And, and secondly, if, if the regulators don't understand what your product or, or, or the risks and the business very well, then you, you know, trouble will come. So uh, I think we need to be able to explain uh, in, in layman's language or, or, or clearly at least, you know, same business, same risks, same rules. So what exactly is the business and what are the risks? You know, be upfront with that. So once you get a regulatory framework that people can be comfortable with and you get investor education and you get ratings, then I think you, you really do have a you know, powerful combination. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, how about you, Latin and Amy? How do you see um, we can um, improve the liquidity of the market and get like more people coming in and you know, you, I heard a comment earlier about DeFi. You know, this, are there? Do you see anything, any breach between DeFi and, and security token space? Absolutely. So, um, where where the, you can apply collateral and make maker or a compound, um, and uh, and you can trade basis on that. Maybe one important aspect because we have talked about what is the goal and what is the benefit for an institution when it comes to STOs and how they can save costs and in uh, creating a new financial product is going to be much cheaper. But as a private person, I think it is amazing that it opens up a whole new spectrum for me because I can invest in a, in a private company before they go public. I can invest in NFTs, the non-fungible tokens. I can invest in art, in equities, um, in fixed income. And, you know, maybe today it's, it's not that easy as a private person to invest in these assets. So uh, 
the, the whole notion of democratizing finance is so much strongly there and and we should um, not have this panel without without mentioning that um, to to answer your question um, further I think that um, yeah like like you you asked about uh, regulation right remind me of, of the last question sorry sam um, about about liquidity so and where, whether you see also like on the DeFi, because they're huge liquidity on the DeFi space now right like oh, yeah. a lot of money there right like yeah, is there, do you so... see a bridge you know channeling some of those into like more compliance i'm not sure if DeFi is fully compliance right but i mean like you know but but what we are talking about like fully compliance sto digital securities right yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, DeFi is not uh, regulated per se, and and I also believe that you should not be over regulated or as in we we try. Sometimes I feel like we have this notion of regulating something what kills innovation. Like if you over regulate, then you really kill the innovative element of of this whole new emerging space. So um, when it comes to liquidity, uh, and we we need more and more secondary market venues, which we don't have now. I mean, you guys, you just said that um, this uh, STO exchange in Hong Kong has already launched, great. In Switzerland, for instance, I can, I can speak for the Swiss environment. As of 1st of August next year, um, companies can apply for, um, for an STO uh, exchange license. Now, whether that is going to be easy to get or it's going to be um, not too expensive, so that it limits the the entry for all these players who want to uh, have the security uh, token exchange license. We yet need to see, but we need all these venues in order for uh, the secondary to, for for liquidity to 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 pick up. And um, I think that's that's a great point. Yeah. So so I'll, I'll take this. Uh, I, I know like. You have been like, low. yes. Yeah, so for, for DeFi, right, to me, I've been- With a lot of, uh, yeah. There's, there's, yes. there's, there's a delay, Please but there is a, so I've been heads down on DeFi for almost eight to nine and nine months. Uh, to me, uh, Martin, to your point, single marketplace, single set of rules, which attracts liquidity and, and transparency in general, you know, attracts capital. But, uh, you know, to Lori's point, I think in general, you know, DeFi is to me a basket of, of a bunch of, you know, which represents to me uh, innovation in the product, you know, marketplace. So an, an ecosystem that attracts not just innovative products, but in, innovative technology that leads to, you know, creating an interconnected set of incentive economics of various systems, thereby creating in the truly global marketplace that, that Martin talks about. So DeFi to me, you cannot have a stable coin, you cannot have a, any of the STO or any of the instruments that are emerging in the in the in the digital transaction space to the crypto space. Uh, DeFi becomes sort of the all-encompassing term that could be utilized to be able to demonstrate the ever-growing ecosystem, uh, which again, to me as a technologist, represents the innovation and in products innovation. And and so we have to be careful, or at least, and I, I think. It's refreshing to see the regulators around the world. We have to be careful that we don't stymie that innovation by over-regulating uh, these DeFi products, but understand that there's a lens that we have for in terms of regulation and applying the appropriate lenses to various type of these securitized token or security token, and they're two different things. And, and then sort of create a framework, which I think Switzerland has done a fairly good job and various other jurisdictions around the world is to create that model, which sort of not only keeps in mind the innovation, but also fuels the intent, which is truly, you know, doing what internet has done for information, doing what blockchain and crypto would do for financial products. So I'll leave it at that, but I think that's a, that's a really good point that both, you know, uh, Emmy and Martin make. That's great. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Well, well, time really flies. Uh, we are coming to the end of the panel. Um, uh, I'm sure we can talk for another two hours. Um, so really thank you for all the insightful sharing. Um, so I would like uh, each of you, maybe you can share a wrap up comment about how do you, what do you like to see uh, to happen um, in the ecosystem to facilitate such wishing of, of bringing um, the, 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 the digital securities into a, a, a much bigger development and market and growth in the future. 
So feel free, who would like to? Amy, please. To go first. So definitely we need a standardization and a clear regulation and also interoperability, which is a word I always pronounce wrongly, but you all know what I mean. Yes, absolutely. Interoperability translate into global global markets. Correct. Right. Yes. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Yeah, to, to me, ecosystem should, should enrich sort of the marketplace. That's the intention by bringing in the diversity of various players and that diversity itself brings diverse products, diverse technologies. And to, you know, to what Amy mentioned, interoperability is a big part of that, which is the ability for me to move an asset in tokenized form in different networks, different jurisdictions. So I think to, you know, uh, bringing that diversity, both in sense of product innovation and technology innovation is something that I think uh, ecosystem should focus on. Absolutely, yeah. Chris? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to, uh, I think the diverse products, I think we've seen, uh, I've probably been 50 or 60 products this year that just amazed me um, what people can come up with. And I like those ideas coming on market. Um, and I wanna see kind of that innovation drive then the technology and then also drive the regulator. Um, I like that they're keeping a bit of a hands off now um, and I hope they continue to do that. And I think that'll really help the market grow. And then it will settle. I think it will settle when it finds its niche. Um, it, but I'm look, really looking forward to it. It's really fun to watch. I mean, every week I'm presented with a new idea. It's amazing. Yeah, isn't it amazing now people can uh, tokenize anything, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Martin? Yeah, well, I, I agree. I mean, I think it's happening. I mean, it, it's, it's beginning. I'd like to see, of course, um, you know, uh, I think the more people, the more ideas, uh, they build on each other. Um, you get this network effect uh, and uh, the snowball builds and um, hopefully it doesn't sort of overwhelm us all. I think there is, there's a bit of a danger there that um, you know, uh, something uh, goes wrong. I, I the retail market may have to be treated a bit carefully. I think this is possibly something more for professional investors. Um, and uh, I, 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 you know, something like Facebook and Libra, they, they announce it. But then when people realize the implications, then it slows down again. So I think um, uh, it's on the right track, the momentum's building, um, but let's not run before we can walk. Yes, absolutely, yeah, thank you. I think just the fact that, you know, look at our panel today, you know, people from different backgrounds coming together, trying to drive the industry forward is an exciting step. And this is happening. And thank you for Next Change uh, for providing this panel. So uh, really glad uh, to be your host and greatly appreciate for all the guests. And thank you very much. Um, so I think uh, we will uh, uh, maybe wrap it up here. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Sam. Sam. Great. Thanks, Sam. Sam. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. May I also uh, send in one message uh, tonight by 8 o'clock in Hong Kong time, there will be the award ceremony of TARTS Awards. TARTS Awards is the world first annual international award for tokenized asset and digitized securities. So there will be 10 winners will be announced tonight. Uh, very exciting project. So stay tuned and uh, look at the, the registration details on the Hong Kong Blockchain Week website. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks Thank you so much. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.